when somebody writes a book who I know, um, I, I want them to come on this show. Certainly when uh, I'm a big fan of their work and our children go to school together for as long as they have, full disclosure, all those things. Um, the author of How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question, where all books can be acquired right now. The man has uh, created so many terrific television programs, including The Good Place. Michael Sure, good to see you, sir, for I'm a second. so time. happy to be here. Thank, Thank you, you for having Thank me. you for coming here. Greatly appreciate it. So let's get into a, a couple of things first before we get to the book here. It, is it true? Um, were you behind the, the Joe Morgan thing back in the yeah, day? Yeah, uh, a couple friends of mine and I back in early two thousands. Yeah, uh, send each other so many texts and emails complaining about the way the baseball was written about and talked about. Mm -hmm. That one of my friends, Dave King, said we should just start a blog so that we don't have to bother each other. Just yeah. every time we see something we don't like, we mm -hmm. write it down. <laughs> so we started this blog called Fire Joe Morgan. We didn't think very long about the title of the blog. We, it was a bad, I, I didn't never like the, what, it, what we decided to call it. Yes. He wasn't the only problem. Right. There were many problems. So we just started this thing where every time someone said something or wrote something stupid about baseball, we would make fun of it. And then Will Leach was running Deadspin at the time and started right. linking to us. And suddenly this thing, we went from having eight readers a day, yes. which was the four of us and then four of our friends, mm -hmm. to like 15, 20,000 very quickly. And it was, uh, it was wild. And we were anonymous. We, did, we had decided, again, with no thought. We had, we put, I can't explain how little thought we put into this. <laughs> we, had, we had made ourselves anonymous. And so eventually it was like, well, this is weird. Like, I feel like the accused have a right to face their accusers here. Yes. So we came out and announced who we were. At the time I was writing on The Office, and I played the character Mose on The Office, Dwight Schrute's <laughs> ghoulish beat farming cousin Mose. And so then all these articles got written that was like, this sports blogger is Mose from The Office. Yes. Yeah. Putting so it, two and two together. Yeah. And then that made the readership go up even higher. And it, it, the whole thing was very weird. So Joe was emblematic is what you're saying. Joe was what, emblematic. What, yes. The way that he talked about baseball on the Sunday night broadcast. What's the wrong? What, what is wrong? He with, was very dug in. This was right when Moneyball was changing everything, right? Yes. The book had come out and people were beginning to think that batting average isn't a good way to analyze how good a baseball player is. There are other stats that are better. And there was an old school crew of people who were saying, no, this is the way we've always done it. I know how to, I know how to, I played baseball. I know how to analyze baseball. You can't tell me, a computer can't tell me, blah, 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 blah. So there was just this division. It's pretty much gone now. Mm -hmm. Like we couldn't do that blog now because now people have generally accepted that OPS is a better stat than batting average. But at the time there was this real division between the old school guys and the new school guys. And so it was just the old school guys refusing to listen to reason. or. To, so you were you know. blogging on behalf of metrics. I was you're saying, yes. <laughs> That's and groundbreaking. the way you say that makes me think that I wasted my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly your uh, your accomplishments would uh, counter that argument. All right, sir. fair enough. I think uh, you'd counter that argument. So you were writing for the Office at the time. Yeah, you were writing for SNL first. That happened SNL ninety eight to oh four Office what oh four to oh eight. Was that like to be an SNL back it, in the day, man? I I'll mean, tell you, man. It was. Great. Like, uh, and, and, but the word great encompasses a lot of stuff yes. starting with, I was miserable because I got the job right out of college. I was completely unqualified and I sucked at it. Like, uh, and, and this is not false modesty. Like I was actively terrible and <laughs> it's a very weird place where it's very sink or swim. Like you show up on your first day, nobody shows you where the bathroom is. Nobody tells you how anything works right. on my first day there. Yes. I was like, so I, I finally, at like 4 p.m., I'd been there for hours, and I was suddenly, uh, I, I said to a, a guy I knew, so what, like, what, ha what happens? Like, what, what, are, what am I supposed to do? And he was like, well, you know, we write sketches, and then you know, there's a read-through on Wednesday, and in a couple hours, we have the, you know, the, the host meeting. And I was like, sorry, what now? And he was like, yeah, we go into Lauren Michaels' office, and we pitch the host of the show uh -huh. our sketch ideas for the week. I had no sketch ideas for the week. I had just oh started. I didn't God. know I had to do this. So I frantically went to my office, dreamed up a couple terrible sketch ideas. And 90 minutes later, we're sitting in Lauren Michaels' office with Samuel L. Jackson, <laughs> the most intimidating human being on earth. And they and I was like, thir I sat in the corner, but Lauren happened to start going around the room with like the person just to my right. So one second after that, he was like, Mike, what do you have? And I was like, here are my sketch ideas for you, Mr. Samuel L. Jackson, world's most famous and intimidating actor. Was this like around Pulp Fiction time? Is it, that when no, it was well, it would have been 04, so it was okay. later than that. Okay. It, but, but his stature had only grown. Sure. Like He was right. only more Samuel L. Jackson at that point than he had been. Right. 
So that's the kind of place it is. And I was very bad at it for a long time. Eventually, I like figured it out. Things started to click. And from that point on, I, I had a great time. So and which get maybe got you where I, you wanted to go? Do you remember? There, like I started writing sketches. I started writing a parody of Hardball with Chris Matthews, the old show on MSNBC. <laughs> Daryl Hammond played Chris Matthews. That's right. I remember and, that. And sure. um, he did a great Chris Matthews. And, and at the time, so this is 04, 05, like a lot's going on. I mean, a lot's always going on, but right. we were in the Middle East and, you know, mission accomplished banner and all that sort of stuff. And I started to figure out um, I'm sorry, wait, this is way earlier than that. This is like 2001. This is like right. 9-11, like the, the war was just beginning. Right. And there were people who were um, on extreme, it was the beginning of that sort of media craze of like, have one person on from the left, have one person on from the right and have them fight. They first taked, it was the pre-first take <laughs> politics version, right? So I just started writing those sketches with other people who, where we would have one person representing the left, one the right, and then we would have one just lunatic, Tracy Morgan usually just playing some lunatic who was just screaming about something. Those, like once I figured out, okay, I kind of, I'm seeing something in the culture and I understand how to present it. And then it, the job got a lot easier. Well, I mean, Michael Schur, the uh, author and uh, writer, creator, producer, right here on the Rich Eisen Show. We had Tracy Morgan on. When did we have him on, guys? Like two months ago when Three he called in? Ago, yeah. He called Three in and told a story about he met Lorne Michaels for the first time outside of Yankee Stadium. Sure. Um, not going to the game, but he was scalping tickets. Great. And what he's selling cocaine is what he said as well. <laughs> he, like, mean, it's what he said, yeah, right? He said, much. right? Scalping tickets, selling cocaine. That's yeah, what he was doing. All else. of that stuff. Great. And what you got any good Tracy? Morgan he was my stuff? office mate for my <laughs> second and third years at the show. I don't know that I ever saw him in my office. Like he wasn't. <laughs> and w by the way, that's not rare. Like there's some actors yes. on that show write a lot of stuff. Some mm. don't. Like yes. it's any. There's any number of different ways you can function of the show, right. but I, he was my office mate and I literally never saw him. But he did give me, for the first time in my life, he gave me a nickname. Okay. I had never had a nickname in my life yes. until Tracy started calling me Sure Shot. Sure Shot. And I was like, this is the greatest. I'm so <laughs> happy about this. And to this day, I haven't seen him in years, but every time I see him, he goes, Sure Shot. Like it's immediately right out of his mouth. It's good, the best. That is the best. Yeah. That is the best. Sure shot. Oh, my God. Um, so, all right. Let's get into um, your book. Um, you sure you don't want to talk Boston sports first? We, well, no, I, I'm, that's how I'm getting into it. <laughs> how to be perfect, the correct answer to every moral question. You have one, right, Chris, for him right off the bat? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, go for it. Yeah, it. Go for it. Get into it. Go for it. I will never, ever, as long as I shall live, will forgive John Henry for trading Mookie Betts. That's it. That's all. I, that's my moral. Yeah, is that a moral I, question, or how, that's do just, I, how do I get past? No, it's a moral question. Does that fit? Yeah. Does that fit the mold yeah, of he, your? Here's what like I would he, say. Seventy. I didn't want to pay an extra seventy million because he wanted to be paid three hundred plus. You, you own Liverpool. It's like in your couch cushion. Right. True. Or don't pay Nathan. All right, let him answer. Stop. Stop. My God, this is not EEI for crying out loud. I got it. <laughs> uh, thank God it's not EEI. Um, I, here's what I'll say about this. Uh, you're. Uh, uh, all the reports were he wanted to leave, that he wasn't going to sign, that he wanted to test free agency. Uh, and given that, was it a prudent move to trade him when they could get something back for him? Possibly. Is it good that, you know, you have Verdugo as a young guy, salary controlled, coming up through now, now a, a crucial part of the team? Absolutely. All that being said, I'll never forgive him either. Thank you. It's, it was the wrong moral decision. It was a morally corrupt decision to trade Mookie Betts. If you have Mookie Betts, I don't care if he's going to leave. I don't care if it's better for the team. You keep him as long as you possibly can because yeah. he's the world's greatest living human being. And he's also exactly. yours, right? Like he's he's the one oh, that no. you, you saw from the minute he first stepped on a field. Uh, you look, know? we don't know what he offered. We don't know what Henry offered him at all. We have no idea. He might have offered him right. trout plus a dollar. I don't know. <laughs> the point is that you you don't ever... That guy should have played 22 years in a Red Sox uniform, had his number retired... And had been paid. I don't care if the team sucks for 15 years. I just want to watch that guy play for my team. So you do everything you possibly can to keep him. That's what I think. And the moral, the the moral decision of this is just doing something the it's right just, thing for your fan it's base. It's really friend. just I'm angry. That's right. <laughs> it's not much exactly. beyond that. Okay. And I will never not be angry about it. Yeah. That's right. certainly now that he's out there, you get a front row seat here in Los Angeles. Well, to greatness. that is great, by the way. As a resident of Los Angeles, I, my son and I have gone to see yes. the Dodgers play 
12 times since he came out here, and it is wonderful to see him. So now this perfect thing as well, I wanted to ask you, because again, uh, and then we'll get into questions specifically that are asked in this book. Here's a moral question for you, Michael Schur, because I know your son is a diehard baseball Mm -hmm. kid. Yeah. Cooper and I do a fantasy league together. Zan also contributes. Right. And they're asking me, when are we going to do the fantasy baseball draft this year? And I had it. I made that look that you're giving me right now. Like, how do I explain a lockout? Yeah. To my child. How do I explain corporate children? greed to a <laughs> nine year old? Yeah. You know what I'm saying, like, how do I? Well, you know what? They're trying to figure out a luxury tax. Like, how do? Like, what do you? Like, I, I basically said I don't know if there's going to be one this year. And yeah. And the question comes back, why? And I'm like, well, they're arguing over how to be paid, you know? Yeah, like, that's it. I know. It's hard. And, you know, what's really sad is, like, I am watching. My son lives, breathe, eats baseball and basketball and football, too. But right. baseball was his first love. And I'm watching it affect him in real time. Like, he's just like, what the hell? Like, why Why is this? What are they doing? Why can't we have baseball on, on April 1st? Right. And I can run through the situation about the history of the union and Kurt Flood and Marvin Miller and this and that. <laughs> yeah. and he doesn't care. He wants baseball. You know what I mean? Like, I, and yeah. the labor practices uh, that are under scrutiny and the own ownership practices are, it really makes you realize when you explain it to a kid, yes. how cruel this is of specifically the league and ownership to not be more uh, desirous of a full season because all kids want, all baseball fans want Watch damn baseball games right. on April, starting April 1st. You count on this sport to bring you from April to October every year, and they're just going to deny us that, and it's driving me nuts. So have you had this conversation with Will? I yeah. have, and he's he just, he he understands, that he's old enough to have the- 13. Yeah, right. he's old enough to have the basic understanding of like, owners are greedy, players were treated unfairly for a long time. It's that quote, I can't remember who it is now, said uh, owners screwed us for the first 60 years and now we're going to screw them for the next 60. Like that was Mm. when the free agency thing happened. But regardless, you can explain it all you want. The end result is there's no baseball and it's horrifying. Well, I got my kids a Donald Fear pop-up book and, you know, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you know, it's better than a Jeffrey Kessler scratch and sniff. (laughs) <laughs> for kids I'm sorry you know what I mean I'm like so done with this thing right now the labor like, the, yeah, the like it, because you know what's coming you yeah. know it's you know that it's gonna go to the- well now the crazy thing now is not to go too far down this rabbit hole they're just arguing about money my friend Joe Poznanski wrote about this the other day yeah. it's now like most of the other stuff the arbitration years and the, this and manipulation that that stuff's mostly either been settled or gone away it's just money now and that's what makes it worse to me is like if you're just arguing about money, then you, a collection of 30 billionaires, yeah. ought to find the money to make this go away. That's like, the idea. Yeah. So uh, what is the idea of your book, Michael Schur, How to Be Perfect? And uh, what you came up with it right So here. this Very Good Place looking cover. Yes, as well. it is. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, it came out of the, the show, The Good Place. I w- got to the end of that show and I had spent five years or so reading all this moral philosophy and all these theories of ethics and then talking about them with very smart people and funny people and taking all these ideas that are very dense and frankly pretty boring in their original forms and figuring out how to put them into the mouths of people like Ted Danson and Kristen Bell and make them funny and palatable. And I just kind of felt like I wanted to like collect it all in one place. Right. Like, and, and I found the understanding of these theories to be very helpful in my own life. Like I, like at least now when I screw up, if I blow something, Mm -hmm. I at least know why like that, which is a very comforting thing. It's like, Oh, here's what I did that was wrong here. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a lot of people might enjoy knowing theories of ethics if they didn't have to struggle through an 18th century German text that nobody really (laughs) wants to read. So I decided to just try to make a book that was like, I'm, we're at dinner and you ask me like, hey, what's, what are these theories of ethics about? And I am talking to you like a normal person instead yes. of an 18th century German philosopher. And so uh, questions like what um, that, that you're asking to, I have a couple right here. Can I still enjoy great art if it was created by terrible people? That's a good one. That was the hardest chapter to write by far. Right. I mean, that's, that to me is like, that's a sports fan question at its heart, right? Because <laughs> you, if you're a sports fan, you are immediately morally compromised. Your team, your owner stinks, 
and has done terrible things. <laughs> your the players uh, have done terrible things. The league has done terrible. Like if you're a football fan, which I know you are, yes, and I, which am, I am, Michael. Too, yeah, like it, right. like no, the the number of like moral quandaries you're facing every time Sunday rolls around and you turn on the game are endless. Like in right. and, and the from the league itself to the ownership. I mean, Jerry Jones just very quietly paid some cheerleaders two and a half million dollars so that they wouldn't sue him because one of the if team officials was peeping at them like like a old timey pervert through some keyhole or like taking videos of them in the locker. I mean, this is horrifying. And that's far from the only scandal the Cowboys have faced. And Jerry Jones basically runs the league and you can go on and on and on. Right. So every time you have this thing that you love and you tune in to watch it, mm -hmm. you can't help. I think, but also have buzzing in the back of your head. Like, is this okay? And not to mention the fact the game itself is so violent and so many guys have been hurt and their lives have been ruined. And we just kind of try to forget it. We so put what's, blinders on. What's the answer then? The so, answer is yes, you can. Well, then there's also, just to complete the thought, there are also directors and actors and, and artists and whoever, celebrities that we love and that are mean a lot to us. Like I talk about Woody Allen. Woody Allen was key for me mm -hmm. in terms of my own development as a comedy writer. He made me want to be a comedy writer. And then you grow up and you learn some really unpleasant things about Woody Allen and you start to look at his work differently. So the thing I say in the book, and it's a fairly long argument, is the only mistake I think you can really make is trying to actually trying to separate these two things is trying to either ignore the problems that these people have created or in t if they really mean something to you mm -hmm. cutting them out of your life entirely because it's, that's how we develop as people as we learn about this comedian and this athlete means something to us and we share experiences but I, wa I watched you know football games with my son when he was just learning about sports and those memories are meaningful to me so you just kind of have to keep these two ideas in your head at the same time like this thing is important to me and also it's problematic and in dividing them is is unnatural and i think a problematic thing and it's uh, that's why it's so difficult to come up with the answer in a way and that's why the t is uh, off that's right off on the side here for how to say that's how to be perfect and then oh there's a t right oh, there's there. a t over there right yeah. there uh michael sure here on the rich eisen show before i let you go i want to pitch you an idea great okay you must get pitched ideas all the time by the way how to be perfect maybe a better book yes, how to be Vontaze perfect <laughs> you, heard yeah, you heard that Guy had an that. interesting life all right heard you that. must get pitched all the time like literally i got an idea for you yeah because you're you and you because you can make it happen you've got deals you've got people you got ways to do What's it called all right juice Rich. here's a here's an idea here's an idea you tell me if you green line this all right it stars tom brady okay I have you at hello right Heard here. Of okay, him. your yeah. eyes. Okay, your your eyebrows. <laughs> it stars Tom Brady, and as a matter of fact, he's going to be in it. He agrees to be in it. This is already a. I'm leaning in. Okay, you're leaning in. Uh, it is a story um, about four individuals who are lifelong friends okay. and diehard fans of the Patriots, who take a life changing trip to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 51. Is that the one where uh, it looked like... The 28-3? Uh, to three? The 28-3, to three, right? Yeah, okay. Um, to see Brady play. And the four people are octogenarians. It's called 80 for Brady. And the people who are in it, here are the four stars who are, who are going go. to get to, on this road trip Lay together. Here they are. They are put up on the screen. Lily Tomlin. Um, it is Jane Fonda. It is Rita Moreno. And Sally Field. <laughs> I mean, instantaneous green light. You green light? Absolutely. You're look in. At those, look at those four. Those are four of the greatest uh, actors of all time. <laughs> like that. Oh, absolutely. And Brady's, I assume, playing Tom Brady. It's Tom Brady. He plays Tom Brady. Yes. Yes. So what? So He's what's the problem? It. He's producing it. So you get to meet him. You get to hang with him. I mean, uh, absolutely in. green light this. That sounds hilarious. I, it was so much less terrible an idea than it when I heard that Tom Brady was <laughs> going to be in a movie. <laughs> So right away we're doing well, but those Rita Moreno and Lily, you wouldn't greenlight a movie with Rita Moreno and I Lily Tomlin and I, I, Jane Fonda? I, I, no, I, I, I totally would. And, and it doesn't involve, I guess, you know, these alien eggs and they jump into a pool together and feel young again. Like, it's not that. <laughs> but it, look, um, if you told me that Tom Brady was going to be in a movie where he played like secret agent, you know, Jack McClane or something and it was saving it, whatever, I would say no, absolutely say not. No. He's going to be terrible. Yeah. He's playing Tom Brady. He's he, knows, playing he knows how to do that. Well, we've seen Ted 2, right? So yeah. he's done yeah. that yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. Entourage he's been in. Yeah. Okay. So he's had a history of doing that. By the way, hosted SNL after I was gone and was super funny.
It's like, Tom Brady's falafel city. I'll never forget that. That, that, that skit. That skit. Very good. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think I'm just caught off guard that the four people I thought we'd see him with next, if anything, would have been Godwin, Evans, Fournette, Gronk. and Arians, yeah. and Gronk. Not Fonda... Tomlin, Field, and Moreno. And Moreno, you know. I mean that, but that's what makes it a good idea. That's unexpected, right? You're gonna go see that movie. I'm gonna, you and I, I are gonna I? go. You and I are gonna go together. <laughs> <laughs> Opening night. I don't know if that's a quad one win, sir. I don't know if that's a quad that's a one. quad one idea right there. I'm, I'm all in on this. Because anybody who pitches you, I got Brady. He's gonna star in it. He's gonna be. No, himself. that's where I'm like, oh boy. That's you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that, the addition of four of the greatest female four. actresses of yes, all time. If and Brady playing Brady, like the one thing you know he knows how to do is be Tom Brady. Like, well, how is that bad? This is this is a great idea. Who who do you cast as Belichick? Because you got to get him in well, there. Well, Mark right? Wahlberg wants to do it. He can't play <laughs> Wahlberg in a hoodie as no. Belichick. He no, said he wants just, to do it. You just get an Easter Island head and you animate it. That's what it is. <laughs> Our second Easter Island <laughs> reference is <laughs> this, this, this is too good. This is too good. Let's workshop it a little bit more. Rich, well, let me. Um, can I ask Michael? Since we're pitching him stuff, what about a show oh, stop. based on this no. show with Danny DeVito starring as the Michael Del Tufo character? No. Okay, so I heard I heard you talking about this backstage. Oh, if you want to do a show about four people who have a simulcast piece. Peacock, yes. serious radio show. Yes. I'm in if the four people are Sally Field, Rita Marina, <laughs> Lily Tomlin. They're very Jane versatile Fonda. actresses, well, though, so um, they could, they, they could make it work. Unfortunately, it appears they're not available, Michael. That's why I knew it was safe to pitch They're not them. available because Tom Brady poached them from our idea. Wait, so speaking of Brady, real yeah. quick, Mike, where, was, where did you come out on the moral dilemma facing New England fans the last two years about rooting for the Bucks? I don't think that's a moral dilemma at all. I... Look, Tom Brady, you and I have talked about this we a have. lot. Yes, we have. Tom Brady brought me more sports fan joy yeah, than anyone could ever has brought any sports fan ever. Yeah. Like, by, by the quantifiable fact. And all I want for him is success and happiness and glory. I rooted for Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl when he was in it. Yeah. I wanted him to win. Like, I, I don't understand if you, it, like, Mookie Betts leaving in his prime is one thing. Tom Brady leaving because he had hit a wall with Belichick and the organization or whatever and wanted to go somewhere else. Godspeed, good luck. I have no problem at all. I, I think the more interesting question for Patriots fans is, how do you deal with Spygate, Deflategate, all that ah, stuff? Ah, that, that's what the rest of the league would that, say. We need another hour to I would to say that cover. didn't exist. Uh, nicely done. <laughs> that's How to Be Perfect, everybody, by Chris Brockman. That's why you don't have that book. Uh, it's, a sure. it's, how, a, it's a leaflet. It's a one-page book. <laughs> just book. ignore it. Just, it, it not, doesn't exist. Just ignore it. Yeah, it's not a book. It's not a book. It's not even a blog about, uh, about statistics. How to Be Perfect, the correct answer to every Moral question, buy it, uh, where all books are sold. Michael Sure, good to see you, sir. Good to see Say you. Say hi buddy. to the family for me. I will. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.